Monday through Thursday, and then our summer program will be 12.30 to 2.30. Next slide. As we go through, as I said, updating the dates of the schools, we are advertising, we are promoting with the help of our communications department as soon as possible what programs are available and when and at what time. So here are the first half of the alphabet. The next slide is the second. And as I said, as soon as we have those TBDs, the, the, the time that will be determined, we will get those updated on the slide. Things still to come. For the SSC schools, we're really working, looking at partnering again with Summer Journey. We received a lot of positive feedback from both students and staff with the amount of materials and the activities that they had with Summer Journey. So we would really like to partner with them again. And then, of course, serve breakfast and lunch. That is feedback that we continually hear that is nice for our students. In the partner district, in the partner district, we are working to finalize the dates of the programs and, of course, by collaborating with building administration, by really strategically trying to think of what buildings are we going to offer extended school year in, as well as what buildings are we going to offer the summer program in, <coughs> to try to keep them in the same building. We are going to continue to hire for staff. Of course, transportation, uh, we will be working on making sure we get the information in as soon as time, as soon as possible. So. We have our kids transported, training for staff in summer, and of course, communicate, communicate with our families. We want to make sure that our dates are out there. We want to make sure that we hear what they say in our surveys and that they understand the program that they see that are out there. Next slide. Questions? Um, I know we have programs that we work with teachers who are graduating. Do we have the same type of program for nurses who are graduating college or nursing school? We need to have a pipeline that's a you know transition. Yes. What it's the uniqueness about what we have with our nurses is nurses have to have pediatric care. And as nurses graduate, it's difficult to find the pediatric support that we need. We are currently working with our adult education program, our LPN program, that's supervised by Dennis Nix, because we have LPNs where we will have them do some of their on-site, um, on like on the word, uh, they're like their internships right. with us in our classrooms and in our schools. That's what we're working on to see if we can't get that movement, mm -hmm. knowing that RNs are wonderful to have, but LPNs in almost all the districts, they also use LPNs as well. So. Yeah. Question. Just uh, practice a lot of research. I was listening, and I was one of the people on uh, politicians in Missouri was pushing to make sure that everybody is getting uh, uh, free breakfast and lunch. Have you heard anything about this? Is this going to happen? I've not heard an update coming out of uh, Jeff City if they are going to mandate that everyone receive free breakfast and lunch, but this district will make sure that all of our students have in our schools. I, I thought they lunch. wanted to make sure that it was not based on me. No, we work with the Dexo and, and we figure out every year. That, that, that was uh, unfair to the, first of all, the escape of the service. They're pushing it. And then they're also pushing to make sure that we eat the grain what was growing in Missouri at the same time. I know that. I'm not sure the colleagues can do that, but, but that's a farm table. No, it is very important in this district, and has been for several years, that our students get breakfast and lunch. So we have always done that. All right, I have two more questions. One, um, so all the numbers for the current numbers of last year seem to be 10% um, lower. Is that normal for December, and those inspection numbers will come in around spring break? Okay. Yes, ma'am. As I, I said, uh, know that our big uh, days that we do gaps, so the mm -hmm. comparison of students are losing skills is during that winter break and then also again at spring break where an IEP team can look at that data and really see if there's any type of regression, or regression over that period of time and then also if the team feels provide ESY services. So they'll probably be. They'll, they'll go up a little bit, yes, ma'am. So I know our school can get curb to curb service with us. Let's say someone's in um, any school district. 
and has an IP, but they don't normally get an SSD bus during school year, do they get an SSD bus during the summer school? So when they would they would have to qualify for transportation as a related service. That's oh. what we typically look at providing that that uh, curb to curb, is what we right. like to call it, service. So that is an IEP team decision and a related service. Can the IEP team put it in for just summer? They would have to qualify. They would have to qualify year round. Right. Yes. Oh, for year round. Year round. Okay. All right. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay, our next one is updated on the 224-225 school and courts calendar. Yes. Good evening, Dr. Cooney, mm -hmm. Vice President of the Hi there. Director. It's me. Yeah. Uh, Wendy Pendergrass. I am going to Do you want to drink or something more? I am drinking. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I'm just saying <laughs> Well, maybe a drink. But... <laughs> Some water right behind me. Thank you, sir. Um, All right. So the updates and approval, please, next slide. Uh, Dr. Keenan has been working with the superintendents in our district uh, the last several months to really look at all of our St. Louis County schools having a unified calendar. Uh, we've been asking for ever and ever, and I think, I know it's going to happen. So, for I know it's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. 24-25 school calendar. So, here are some of the dates that we are together going to do. Of course, uh, staff attendance, because in our joint resolution we have multiple days of professional development and contractual days, we'll have them come in August 6th. Our fall break will then be in October. Our winter break will be at the same time. We often do a two-week winter break. That will be supported. Unified spring break would be incredible, knowing that the supports that we have in both of our technical schools and vice versa for any of our breaks will be similar, if not the same, days so students aren't missing out on any activities happening in their partner districts are our schools. We have our list of professional development days or staff work days and then again we have for 24-25 the date that ESY will begin and that is June 2nd. Next slide. The court calendars if you remember our courts participate in a nine week calendar and three weeks off, nine weeks in attendance and three weeks off. We went ahead and met with staff to see if we could work out a calendar for them as well. We tried to look at dates that were similar with our calendar. However, those students uh, do not participate in other activities, <coughs> so uh, the calendar is a little different. And we uh, work with the courts to get it done, but we do have that available. A little bit different is, of course, that staff will start July 11th, uh, which is prior to the August date, and then they go a little longer, and that will put them out in the end of June, middle of June. <laughs> This year, we're also providing information to the board about our 12-month calendar memo, making sure that uh, we address all of our uh, holidays, paid days, non-work days, and breaks. I, I just what is number 23rd? Non-paid, non-work. What is that? 12-month employees in the district have a 260-day requirement that we work. Some of those months, or I'm sorry, some of those years, we have extra days. So in order to get us to 260, some days we do a non, some years we have to do a non-paid, non-work day to get to 260. That is one of those. <coughs> Next slide. Questions? Okay. Uh, you also have a copy of that memo in your handout. I think this could be. I, I, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I've never been on this one. It's going to happen, man. I'm impressed. It's going to happen. I hear good things. Well, I mean, we all met at, at the SSC roundtable with the superintendent for pretty much all of them agreed on this. So um, <coughs> the, the big thing is they realized that the impact it has on their staffing. So when you have staff that lives in one district and to another district of work to allow that conflict and let a call off. So, um, yeah, they were all pretty much on board. We were the only ones, actually, we were the only ones that had a separate spring break than everybody, most everybody else. So, thank you. Uh, vocational skills training program. 
to Wisdom is coming up here. She's going to talk about the wonderful program that we have for our vocational skills program for our students. Good evening, Board President Cuneo, Vice President Potroff, Directors, Dr. Keenan. My name is Casey Wisdom. I am the Director of Transition Services, um, and in the, in the Transition Department is also the Vocational Skills Program. I'm going to share a little bit of information with you about that program tonight. So the mission of the Vocational Skills Program, and we refer to it as VSP here in the district, is to provide a continuum of supports and services to students and families to assist the students in gaining the skills they need to move on to meaningful and realistic post-secondary goals. Um, we are in a variety of industry areas, and I won't read all of our partnerships to you. You can see them. You, you will note that we have um, the largest amount of partnerships in healthcare and in education. Um, we find it is easier to develop partnerships in those two areas. They're often very mission-driven and are very open to sitting down and talking to us about collaboration and providing students with opportunities. However, we're work working really hard to expand into other industry areas, so you'll see that we have some opportunities in transportation, logistics, manufacturing, hospitality, we're in a few corporate settings, and we're in the St. Louis County Government Center. So we um, work with students when they are finished with their four years of high school. And so we offer a continuum of services while in the vocational skills program. And really students can come out of high school with various skill sets and in various places. It's very individualized. And they can also leave the vocational skills program at various places because it is individualized. So we will work on those very pre-vocational skill development um, skill sets that are working towards being able to be integrated into the community. We're looking at um, how we are working with self-regulation. We're increasing independence. We're working on communication. So some of those skill sets that are needed to be successful <coughs> out in the community. Um, we then will move into more vocational preparation and work readiness. And there we're really starting to hone in on those soft skills or work-related behaviors that are needed in any workplace. We're also starting to really focus on things like pace, rate of work, accuracy of work, what your work stamina is throughout the day. Um, and then finally, we have some opportunities that are industry-based job training. And in these opportunities, students are on the cusp of being ready for employment, and they are coming into a site, and they are selecting a job that they're going to train in, and they're going to learn the full job. And then when they are ready for graduation, we are supporting them with a partnering agency to go into job development and seek employment in that specific job. No matter where students graduate from, what, what part of the continuum of our programming, we are connecting them with what is needed next to keep them on their journey or their pathway to employment. Participation in VSP is an IEP team decision. So it's really that high school IEP team that is really considering if the vocational skills program would benefit a student. They are supported by a transition facilitator from my department. Um, and that team is looking at those skill sets, what that post-secondary goal is, and if the student continues to need to work on IEP goals related to that post-secondary goal to move on successfully when they're finished with us. So they, students do need to to demonstrate that need for continuing on beyond those four years of high school. So that's a big decision for a team to make. Students have post-secondary goals related to integrated employment. Um, so for some students, that's a longer-term goal. They're going to need to go on to some other services following us to reach that integrated employment goal, but that is the primary goal. Graduation is considered at every annual IEP and occurs when the student's making sufficient progress towards their IEP goal. So we have some students who come in and they may be with us for six months and they're demonstrating readiness. And we have other students who may stay with us for three years until their, that semester they're turning 21. Side assignment is an administrative decision. We do have a process uh, via a survey for student and families to provide input in terms of what kind of environment, what kind of work they think um, would be best for their students. We also have processes to move students uh, around our sites and among our sites because we know more experience is better. Um, and so we will move students throughout. Our goal is always to move them through that continuum to get them as ready for employment as possible and to experience different types of work while they're in our program. So once students are in the vocational
vocational skills program, they no longer go to high school. That business that they're assigned is their school for that day, potentially for that year, unless we move them to another site for a, a particular reason. When they are with us, they're receiving job skills training in an integrated competitive work environment. So they're out alongside the employees of that workplace learning how to work. They receive direct instruction from their teacher in job skills, interpersonal and social skills, and daily living skills in that place of business. Um, they're increasing their independence in those employability skills, and we also focus strongly on self-determination. And then they receive referral to various eligibility services once they leave us. So that's vocational rehabilitation, that's the Division of Developmental Disabilities, the community rehabilitation providers in the community, so your St. Louis Arc, Easter Seals, MERS Goodwill, and also our independent living center, which is Paraquad in our area. Um, so some student demographics. You will note that um, our uh, population of students with disabilities, about 42% have autism and about 43% have intellectual disabilities. So those are our two biggest populations. Um, those students might require some more support needed if you think about the significance of deciding that someone should stay beyond their four years of high school to receive extended services. Um, you'll see there are um, our, our breakdown by race and by gender as well. These numbers are all of, as of December 1, both our demographics and um, these numbers that show you how many students we have currently in the program and from what school district. So our numbers do fluctuate. As I said, we have many students. I think we've had, off the top of my head, I think we've had about 20 students exit the program already this year. So at any given point in time, our numbers do fluctuate, um, but you can see here the numbers of students that we have currently from our partner district. Next slide. So uh, annually, um, 60 to 65% of our PSP <coughs> graduates obtain employment. Um, if you compare that with national statistics, uh, we're at about 38.8% nationally, and that includes all disabilities. So um, if you break it down to autism nationally, that employment rate's about 20%, and for individuals with intellectual disabilities, it's about 30%. So we're proud of that 60 to 65%. We are always hoping to do better. Um, and it increased that number. Any questions? Yeah, question. Thank yeah. you for the sure. wonderful program. Uh, do you have um, follow-up data collecting? Like, can we do. We're in the midst of it right now. So we, while we are not receiving responsible for the follow-up data because our students do transfer back to their partner district for issuance of their diploma when they're finished with us. Um, we do conduct follow-up for our programmatic purposes, and so we're in the midst of that follow-up right now, which is where that 60 to 65 percent employment rate comes from. We do, a, right now we do a six-month follow-up. Gotcha. Okay. How do you handle, are they even a candidate for VMP? Well, yeah, it really does depend on the behavior. So we will, if we have teams that want to problem solve with us around that behavior regulation piece, um, we may make some recommendations for what might be done back in the high school to help support that. And do you know that students may stay in their high school beyond their four years and transfer to VSP maybe in their fifth or sixth year? So we may recommend some more readiness, you know, some more work around behavior. We do have sites at South Tech and North Tech, and those sites go out to another business for only a portion of the day. And that's really where we will start students who may not quite have the regulation to be completely out in a business full day. Okay. Um, so we're really working to try to do what's best for that student, right. get their skill sets where they need to be to be able to come into VSP and then provide the appropriate supports to enable them to be in a business full day eventually. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. I have another question. If, sure. So if a child um, enters the VSP program and <clears throat> turns out it's deemed to be uh, not a good fit. Maybe they are overly aggressive. Maybe they're not able to do job skills. Um, and let's say they're 19 or 20 years old. Are they able to go back and 
continue at our other programs with their IEP? And how would that work? Yes, we've worked with, so in your example, sometimes we will keep that, um, not sometimes, we do, keep that door open with the home high school. So there may be a student that we know coming in may or may not be a right fit, but we want to give them an opportunity. So we can do a couple of different things. We've had students come to us two days a week and stay at the high school three days a week. So we see if it's a good fit. Or let's try a six-week period and gather some data and see if it's a good fit. <clears throat> Sometimes the home high school will send a, a staff person that's well-known to that student with them if that student has had some para support. And we'll keep that para with us for a period of time to see if we can fade that. Um, so we have a variety of approaches. We have on occasion have, have had students go back to um, their home high school and or work with them to connect to maybe a more appropriate adult placement. Um, with an agency as well. The capacity for BSP, in other words, you gave us the number of students enrolled, but how, I mean, how full is the program? So, uh, well, so we ask that uh, anyone sending a student to BSP try to hold that IEP and have that decision made in the first semester. So we can look at our staffing levels and our site development levels because we have to have the sites to be able to place them. So our capacity right now is right around 230. Um, if though we saw, and we could we collect projected numbers in students' junior year. So if a team thinks that a student might be a candidate, we have those numbers so we can start actively site developing if we think we need to expand. And several years ago we did that. We had to add two sites. Um, and we're always looking to add sites. We're always assessing our sites and determining if we can find better opportunities in place anyway. So um, we're always constantly in that site development process. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, our last talk, I'll just portion out. Good evening, President Cuneo, Board Directors, and Dr. Keenan. I'm Shakita Moore, Chief Officer of Partner District, and tonight I will be presenting information on disproportionality. Dr. Macklin will also support me with providing information on disproportionality as it relates to DEI. Next slide. This presentation will provide insight from an equitable lens as we focus on the purpose, definition, the budget process, as well as our collaboration with each of our partner districts focusing on disproportionality. Next slide. As you know, there are three tiers that we use um, to support our work and efforts with each of our partner districts. We focus in Tier 1 on all 22 districts. In Tier 2, this is where we focus on disproportionality. And currently, there are 11 districts that are receiving support to um, focus on disproportionality and improve the outcome in each of those districts. Tier 3 is where we focus on high needs. And there are eight districts throughout the county in which we support in that way. Six of our DISPRO districts are also high needs districts, and I'll talk about that a little bit later during this presentation. In Tier 2, with disproportionality, again, we're focusing on how we develop the framework to support partner districts across the county. The additional supports that we provide that focus on the areas identified for each of those <coughs> partner district schools. And then also focusing on the social, emotional, as well as some of the academic outcomes of students in those districts. Disproportionality exists when students in a racial and or ethnic group are more likely to be identified as a student with a disability. With a particular disability, they are placed in a more restrictive setting and are suspended and are expelled more than students in any other ethnic Next slide. According to DESE, over-identification and disproportionality, the state has, in effect, policies and procedures that are designed for districts um, that they use to prevent inappropriate over-identification and disproportionate representation um, by race, ethnicity of students as students with disabilities. Slide. Suspension and exposure rates, according to DESI, 
This is where the state examines data, including um, areas which focuses again on race and ethnicity to determine if significant discrepancies are occurring in the rate of long-term suspensions and expulsions of children with disabilities. If these discrepancies exist, DASI requires these districts to review their practices, their policies, and their procedures and to ensure that these policies and practices are in compliance with IDEA. The state ensures the collection and examination of data to determine if significant disproportionality is based on race and ethnicity, and if it is occurring in the state, the, the state will work with each of those districts again to focus on students with disability and how we are identifying those students with disabilities and to really focus in again on particular impairments and disabilities. Um, how the placement of students, how that looks in each of the districts, but also that discipline piece. What are the incidents that are occurring? What is the duration of those incidents and what are the types of incidents that are occurring? And how does that then play in support with suspensions as well as expulsions? In the case of um, determining significant disproportionality, these three areas here, again, are reviewed. Um, it is important for us as the state to work with each of those districts to review, again, those practices, and then two and three focuses on reserving those maximum funds, and that's where we set aside the 15 percent of those funds in accordance with IDEA, as well as the comprehensive coordinated early intervening services. And then we require, DESI requires um, districts to then ensure that they publicly report on those revisions, their policies, practices, and procedures, and to ensure that they are in alignment and in accordance with IDEK. Again, 15% of those funds must be set aside. And because we are unique in St. Louis County, those funds are allocated to and provided to special school district, and then we allocate those funds to each of the partner districts. It is important that through this process that we address those factors that contribute to significant disproportionality and really focusing in on those early intervening supports. And when we talk about early intervening supports, this is where we're talking about those students in kindergarten through third grade. These funds are to be utilized for students um, in age three through grade 12. Again, this supports students with disabilities as well as students without disabilities. It cannot serve only one group. It cannot be a standalone. And so therefore, it supports all students, but there is conversation with each of our districts to ensure that we're focusing on the needs of those students who are receiving services as well. There are a broad range of activities that include professional development, education and behavioral evaluation, as well as services and support. Some of those services and support um, look like functional behavioral assessment, behavioral intervention plans, positive interventions, as well as other supports such as MTSS. And I will talk about those in a few. Some examples of contributing factors may include the lack of access to quality instruction in a school district, looking at the economic, cultural, as well as linguistic barriers <laughs> to appropriate identify placement of students, the lack of access to screening, as well as the discipline practices in a school district. The information that you see before you describes disproportionate representation, significant discrepancies in discipline, as well as significant disproportionality. All three require an annual review of their process. Disproportionate representation, um, in accordance with our SPT, which is the um, state performance um, plan, which was established in, um, by IDEA in 2004. These are indicators that measure um, the state as well as district services and results for students with disabilities. And so the first category focuses on 9 and 10, and this is where we focus on disproportionality. 
This information is, is reviewed um, for a consecutive two years, and it looks at a group of 20 or more students, and that risk ratio is higher than 2.5. The next area is significant discrepancies in discipline. And so that's the second way that a district can be identified as disproportionate. <laughs> this is where they look at more than 10 days out of school consecutively or cumulatively. Again, looking at two consecutive years of data, and the minimum sales size is looking at 10 or more days out of school suspension. And again, that risk ratio is 2.5 for two consecutive years. When significant disproportionality exists, you're looking at setting aside those funds, which again is 15%. We're looking at the identification of students, where students are placed, as well as discipline removal. And this again is for three consecutive years. And it's looking at a risk ratio that is higher than 3.5%. Before you are the 11 districts that are identified as disproportionate, and again, six of these districts are also identified as high needs districts. That information will be provided on the next slide for us to see and, and dig deeper into the over-identification and or discipline, whichever one um, identifies that district as disproportionate. Disproportion. Next slide. Two of the 11 districts, Rockwood and Melville, um, are identified as disproportionate as a result of over identification of students with disabilities. And the other nine <coughs> districts are in reference to discipline. As you take a look at the end um, column of this table, you see for each of those partner districts how they are currently utilizing those funds that we set aside to support disproportionality in their district. Most of them consist of professional development, um, providing additional personnel, um, such as behavior interventionists, <coughs> um, school psychologists, additional classroom teachers, et cetera. We also have learning platforms that they may use to collect data and to support um, them with decisions that they are making in each of their partner districts, along with additional professional resources um, that they use for instructional purposes. Those, can you go back to one of them, sorry. Those districts that are um, in blue are districts that are identified as tier two as well as tier three partner districts. Each year, one-to-one -one meetings are held with each partner district identified as disproportionate. This includes meetings that focus on partner district goals that we set at the start of the year, and this is where each of our directors work hand-in-hand -hand with the partner district liaison to present their goals, progress, as well as a data review, and mutual problem solving to identify resources that may be needed to address not only disproportionality, but instructional needs of students within a district. Disproportionality planning meetings also take place, and this is our opportunity to dig deeper and to have a deeper dive into goals, the development of action steps, as well as the identification of resources that they see fit to support them within their partner district. Those resources must be um, in alignment with the allowable expenses that have been set by the state for the use of those funds. We also have budget discussion meetings that occur, which allows us to connect goals to budgetary needs, as well as, again, those allowable expenses. SSD provides each partner district with opportunities to commit to our MTSS team for support. Districts must be willing to commit to the MTSS process for decision making and use that framework to guide um, the selection and implementation of best practices for improving the outcome of all students, including students who receive special education services. A continuum of peers is used to ensure supports are in place for students who may require targeted as well as intensive support. And again, this does include students who receive special education services. MTSS provides opportunities, again, to problem solve collaboratively in the areas of academics, social emotional, with an emphasis on trauma-informed care and restorative practices, just to name a few. 
A universal action plan is developed and used to capture goals and outcomes, and this is developed through SSD as well in our teaching and learning department. Through this partnership with each of our partner districts, they must develop a district-level team that is willing to do rigorous work to build action plans, to set roles and responsibilities, and to participate in monthly coaching. MTSS supports all students, including, again, students who receive special education services. Disproportionality resources and funds are used to support all students, including students, again, who receive those services. In the fall, our future work will include a DISPRO Summit that will allow our teams here at SSD, Partner District Administration, Teaching and Learning, as well as our evaluation and research to take a deeper dive into specific data points and for us to provide support with the collaboration of their leadership team, including district level leadership and school level leadership to to support with, again, addressing disproportionality. Before you, you have the budget for the, the fall 24 um, school year, FY24, and how those funds have been allocated in all 22 districts. You also see highlighted here in blue additional tier three support. Again, those are high needs districts. These are districts that have requested <coughs> additional support from us. Of course, this is an opportunity for all districts to request that support, and we do have those conversations with them through our goals meetings, our budget meetings, as well as our disproportionality meetings, those one-to-one -one meetings that take place um, in each of our school districts. And we will have an update to this information during the budget presentation that will occur um, later this school year. So when we really speak to disproportionality and as it relates to DEIA, it's truly understanding uh, the process here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and we really talk about what does disproportionality mean. Um, it really delves into the extent of something too large or too small. Um, always related to, to the most simplistic form of receiving a bag of Skittles. And if you received a bag of Skittles, whatever the case is, and all of the, skip, all of the Skittles in the bag of Skittles were red, it would be disproportionate because of too big or too small. And so understanding that is the driving force as we do the work in DEIA. Next slide, please. The framework which was approved in 2021 really delves into the process of the area of evaluation. It's one of the main places where you see uh, the start of the, the assessment process as it relates to disproportionality. And that process uh, begins into delving into the evaluation of measures of rating scales, uh, achievement assessments, measure of IQ observations, used to really determine an individual strength. And so on the next slide here, you will see that when we really speak to um, where are we delving into to determine um, and to uh, disrupt disproportionality, it, it lies, uh, lies in the assessment phase. So uh, the assessment student assessment, evaluation, and reporting, which is uh, the number four guideline in the framework. Investigating topics um, that lead through inequities. Uh, developing a list of uh, topics that uh, delve into potential bias as it relates to assessments. And then also examining the tools that are used uh, as it relates to assessment and the bias in those tools. Next slide. These are guiding questions which you ask as you really delve into disproportionality. And so uh, where do the proportional outcomes come from? What is the impact? Again, uh, Ms. Moore did a great job of explaining um, the definition for DESI and what that really looks like. Um, how do we respond uh, to disproportionality? And then what are the outcomes as it relates to historical, structural, institutional, um, and those virtues? Questions? Question. Um, <clears throat> this is for, first of all, thank you, Ms. Moore and Dr. Michael, for your presentation. Thank you. Um, I, have, I have questions. Uh, the first one is related to slide number 14 um, and <clears throat> the reasons for the identification. And I, I had a question first about the actual title of the column, over identification, recognizing that obviously over identification can mean under identification of one group versus over identification of the other. But do we have specific details from Melville and Parkwood about? what sort of over-identification is taking place? Yes, yeah. we can provide you that information for each of the uh, districts. 
And then my other question was, Melville is the only school district I see that hasn't been identified as having an issue related to disproportionate discipline. Are they doing something really well, or is there some other factor there that we should identify? I'll respond to that question as well, too. If they figured it out, <laughs> we should find out what they're doing. Uh, I, I can say that um, Melville does uh, use Panorama to support um, as a, a data um, system to really take a look at um, student progress and how to support them. And they are one of the leading districts in the county that has been using Panorama for quite some time. And I'm more than certain that has helped them to decrease um, at their discipline as well as the over-identification of students uh, with disabilities. Next, I have another question. So I realize we um, are not able to directly to direct how the funds are spent, we can advise the school district. How well is our advice taken? Do we, do, do we as a school district believe that they're using the funds to the best of their abilities? Are there things that we think that they should, could do better? And feel free to respond at your comfort level question. I'm able to question. respond at a comfortable level. Um, I'm able to have those conversations with each partner district. We, again, first, we focus on what are those allowable expenses, and then we go deeper into what are you looking to utilize those funds for? Everything is not an absolute yes. Um, for example, if they want to bring in a um, professional development opportunity, I'm going to be taking a look at is it research-based? How will it support and impact students? And asking those questions. And sometimes we have to say no. And so they have to go back to the drawing board to determine how they want to utilize those funds. With that, we do talk about how are you supporting all students, and again, those students who are receiving special education services. Good question. I have another question. <laughs> so obviously this is a source of additional funds for schools. Does that create a disincentive for them to maintain this proportionality to receive funding? I don't believe that any district would use that practice. Um, and most of our conversations center around what's next. What happens when we are not necessarily in this status? How will you continue to support us, or will you continue to support us? And our stance is we will continue to support those districts that are receiving these funds because we want to continue to see that um, the progress that is being made, and we don't want to be a hindrance to that um, process not being able to occur. That's the one flaw with the program is that once you do well, you lose the funds. So um, that's come up in a couple of our discussions with the budget pieces, and we were committed to making sure that we have the 15%. We have to set it aside no matter what. If the districts are, um, they have, <laughs> have been formally identified as moving out of it, So, but we have said that we will continue to. Good question. I don't have a question, but I do have a statement. I'm glad to hear that, uh, and I know this is something new. So we don't have a long history at this point in reference to how this is actually going to work. But I am glad to see that I have two conference individuals who represent SSD, since we then will be the pass-through, so to speak, for these funds to make sure that the best use of these funds is, is, is what outcome can do. So thank you very much for the report, and thank you very much for your abilities that you bring in representing us and making sure that these funds are used properly and that the goals that the funds are set to accomplish, that those things are done. I have a quick question. For the partnership that you're talking about, the principal to decide the suspension, correct? Whether you get the attention of the do the principals ever get professional development days on for SSD students different behaviors? And if somebody who is not trained in the room might accidentally escalate that behavior, de escalate it, and then the child gets too escalated and then we're going to throw the chair. And then the principal comes in, well, child X did Y, therefore suspension. It's like, well, wait, do they get professional development? It's like, oh, wait, let's look at the escalation of that student and what happens, or is it all cut and dry? 
So, so there, are, there are many professional de um, development opportunities that exist for um, principals and for school leaders. Um, to name a few, we have our Principal Institute, which um, provides a, 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 a variety of topics for us to cover and to go deeper into that. Also, through the process, we're talking about the manifestation of, um, you know, students who may receive suspensions and how, and those, that's where those individualized conversations are taking place on how to best support students, you know, when they get to that point of receiving the um, days for out-of-school suspension. Um, in addition to that, through um, those distro funds, a lot of them bring in professional development opportunities to focus in um, not only on students with disabilities, but students who um, may be targeted students um, who require some additional support. Um, again, that's through uh, also through MTSS where they're looking to support, again, those students and, and any student that may um, need those um, additional support. And even in the partnership, <clears throat> as uh, Ms. Morris mentioned, it requires, it's vital um, that all individuals understand uh, that uh, individuals have differences. So those differences um, make us unique, and that's why diversity is, is key in state. Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, Ms. Moore, you mentioned earlier about the commitment level required from our partner district to collaborate with Consol. Uh, have we had instances where our partner districts refused to do quality? This has been a great year. Um, I would say year one and year two in this role. We had some very strong conversations. Um, I think that year three, many of them understand where we stand um, when it comes to disproportionality and how we are supporting districts. Um, in fact, we have presented, Dr. Kenan has presented in partner districts um, in this area to talk about how we will support um, their districts with these funds um, as well as other factors. So along the lines past, um, what was the consequence? Them to cooperate more? Absolutely. I think one of the consequences, and I don't want to call it a consequence, but I want to say one of the supports that helped was the um, revision of the partnership agreement and having each of the directors and those liaisons to present information to the school board. Um, the level of transparency has increased in each of our partner districts where it's not just a signature and um, just a pass off, but to really be engaged in those conversations with partner districts and to be transparent with data. I have a question. This is, uh, my thinking is this is a great idea. We're spending a lot of money here. And we're spending a lot of money on a variety of programs. Those, are those programs submitted to you before the funding is made? Yes. And then is there outcomes based on those programs to determine whether they're a success? Yes, and so through the MTSS, that framework, that action plan that they have, that is one way of looking at that, as well as looking at the goals and the action steps that are um, established. You look at that as well, and that's what that's about. Yeah, and I mentioned before, the reason why I'm getting this is so we have a, we know which programs would work and which ones are not as effective. Sometimes you throw money away. Sometimes you really get a good big bang for the buck. So we know which programs gave us the biggest bang for a buck. Have we benchmarked those? It sounds those? like you were in our cabinet meeting last week. <laughs> we had this conversation. That's it. This sounds like benchmarking to me. Absolutely. And it sounds like well, let's find the ones that work especially the ones we get the biggest bang for the buck, and use these, and then show these to the 20, out of the, bring 22 districts. These are programs that were developed that work. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We might have to tweak it, but we wouldn't have to, and I'm just wondering, have we done that yet? We have not, but what we will be doing in the fall through that DISPRO Summit is having some very engaging conversations with partner districts, bringing them together collectively but at the same time having those breakout sessions and opportunities for them to dig deeper. For us to give an overview, here are some things that are being used in partner districts, and to even potentially have some of those partner districts to present that information. Here's, here's where I'm going with this, okay? I, I was kind of figured that you would like the idea of benchmarking this. If we benchmark this, okay, and we find which of these programs work the best, okay? Not only 
could we share this with our 22 districts, letting them know? You might want to tweak this with these are the type of programs that prove to be effective in our population. Dr. Mackman, since you did such a great job at NSBA last Thank time, you. could we not present this? I mean, this is a hot topic. This Absolutely. is a topic that could be used not only here, but in every school system. And so, in other words, we would be presenting data of programs that were developed through this that have been proven to be effective based upon whatever measures we're using. People wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. I, I don't see why we would not want to, first of all, capitalize and use it for us, but also present to us in our Absolutely. Great point. Great point. Thank you. I have another common question. So, at, at our last governing council meeting, um, a member of the governing council, I believe, who's on another um, part of the school board, mentioned her. Um, Challenges she was experiencing during manifestation hearings uh, with uh, behaviors for kids who had IEPs, and not being sure how much of the challenging behaviors would be attributable to their disabilities versus, you know, parenting, for example, expulsion. <coughs> um, and I'm curious, do we offer our partner school district sports training on manifestation hearings and disabilities and how they might affect student behaviors and so on and so forth? Not our school board. I'd be very interested in. in Developing something like that. Obviously, we really don't have manifestation here because none of this is I've been here, <coughs> thankfully. Uh, but um, I think hearing that comment, I, I think that's something that we could, I mean, we're, we're, we're equipped to provide the education and the training, and I think it serves our students. Thank you for agreeing. All right. Would someone like to make an approval of consensual items? Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? She carries. All right. Action. Uh, Seven oh one. Uh bid no word approval. Someone like to make the most of your approval. Second. All right. Discussion. This is I think that you're interested in this. Bid. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I so, was simply asking uh, the nature of what these bids consisted of. So the the we need diversity. Yes, yes. Of diversity pieces of it. So, um, and what you know, how are we also benchmark our abilities to, you know, reach those that we set in reference to equity. So that's a very good question. And in front of you uh, is a sheet that kind of sums up uh, the bids purchasing and those requirements. It's a uh, hand, not hand, it's typed. And it's uh, staple, so it's two pages. And you'll see the three ways that we do and purchase items. So you'll see that anything over 15,000 has to do, and it must be a sealed bid. You'll see that anything between 3,500 and 14,999 is portal or written price quotations for those purchases. And then you'll see anything under that $3,499 threshold is can just be purchased. We can also make emergency purchases. So if a boiler would go out or we would need to do some emergency work for water main broke, we wouldn't have time to bid that. So those are the four ways that we can do that. There's also exceptions underneath there. Um, one is in lieu of competitive bidding, we can do an RFP or an RFQ, and that's what we do. Um, there's also a single source or unique circumstances, and that's when there's only one feasible source for the region or the one feasible source who sells that. And then thirdly, approved providers, which you enter into a bid with the beginning of the year and you purchase throughout the year because we know those sources. The fourth is a cooperative purchasing agreement, and that is basically a group of businesses come to the government and said, we will give you the lowest bid, and so then we can go ahead and buy that without bidding. And then the fifth is real estate. We don't get into real estate too much. We're not buying or selling it to the point. Um, but really, in regards to your question, 
where we're into the maybe weeby and following that along with percentages is at that formal bid, at that RFP stage. And that's when we require the companies who are bidding on our work to say if they are maybe weeby, if they are that organization, and if they're not, what percent of the subcontracting work will they be doing? And that's where our 15% comes in. And so along the lines of what we have on for approval this evening, so like um, item A is sole source, item B is sole source. So those are two contracts that those are, we can only get those through that one vendor. Um, the third one is through that purchasing agreement, so we're guaranteed the lowest price uh, with that. The fourth one was the social PRN. That was a staffing in which Alan Weed had called about 15 different organizations to try to get a social worker. They offered social workers that weren't in person, and we weren't going to do that. We wanted to make sure they were in person for our students. And so out of those 15, this was the one that said they could provide somebody in person. So it was really almost a unique uh, situation there where we couldn't get anybody else in. And then the last one is a uh, reapproval of our um, lobbyists. We're one of the few school districts that actually has a lobbyist. Most use them SBA or MASA. And so that's really a unique qualifier there as well because there's just nobody else who does that work for us. They know us so well. Um, in regards to your question, like I said, we only really look at that at the, the bid level. So what we're going to do moving forward is as we start to take a look at renewing the sole source, say it's through tech health or, you know, we have a briefing paper through inclusive. We're going to, over the next couple of months, we have a list of all the contracts we have. We're going to start putting some of that information on there for us, but it's going to take a little bit of research because we don't require them to say whether they're maybe we be the demographics. So we're going to do a little research, but we're going to put that together not only when it renews, but we're going to take a look and see is a sole source provider, is it unique, and then we're going to also track whether that's MBE, WBE, or what the demographics look like moving forward. Do, do we ask them those questions even though we're not tracking it? No. The only time we ask them those questions are on the RFPs that are over the 15,000. That's generally for even if, even if they're sole source. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, if I may, and again, thank you for this information. Um, I may offer up this consideration, but I have asked around with some smaller companies that I would think that would be able to fulfill some of the oftentimes have. And you mentioned a moment ago about the lowest bids. Um, what it seems to happen is sometimes their operations costs, smaller companies, they may find themselves needing to charge a little bit more because their capacity, even within the banking structure, doesn't allow them the same interest rate that they have to go get loans and stuff of that nature. So for them to give us the lowest bid becomes an impossibility for them to do business with us. So I'm just making note of that, attempting to make note of that, so that we have those considerations that, in fact, if we are looking to make sure that we encourage the realities of the TV scenario we're talking about taking place, that there are going to be times that we might need to look at, okay, I might have to pay you a little bit more, but it's, it, it, it's kind of the cost of being able to make these particular goals happen. No, you're absolutely right. So we look at it with three things. We have a policy, I want to say it's DJD, <coughs> local vendors. We really try to do work within the county. And so as we look at that, we try to do the work and our money stay in the county because those are the taxpayers uh, giving us mm -hmm. running revenue. So that's one thing we look at. The other is with this um, business diversity workshop that we're doing, mm -hmm. we are really trying to create, and there's on the website where companies can register with us to become a vendor, to become that. So if there's a smaller project that wouldn't require a bid, we would have an option to say, okay, they're local, we can use them, they fit that scope of work. A lot of times some companies don't fit that scope of work, but this would allow them to, and that's one of the things we're trying this spring, is to increase our options when it comes to using some different vendors. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions? Thank you. Roll call. Roll call. Roll call. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. 
Next that we have on the agenda is University of Wisconsin team by our uniform affiliation agreement. Would someone like to make a motion to approve? All right, Curtis, she had a question on this one. Yeah, I was just trying to find out what that consists of. Oh, okay. So you So uh, this is a pretty standard affiliation agreement. Uh, we have it with both uh, in-state and out-of-state uh, universities. It basically just says that we agree to be a site uh, for interns to be able to get uh, the respective hours that they need. We do the same kind of agreements for uh, local and out-of-state universities when it comes to student teaching. It basically says that we agree to provide a site to Thank you. 